Hello and welcome to this 3D Studio Max tutorial. My name is Alex P. Twig and we're going to be covering the subject known as camera matching. So we're going to be taking this 2D photograph and we're going to be introducing a 3D element in. The final result, if you follow it right the way through to the end, will look something a bit like this. So we've added a 3D element and introduced shadows as well, so it really looks like it's embedded into the scene. Okay, I'm going to restart 3D Studio Max now um, and uh, just so I... Uh, good base point with you um, and I'll just show you um, in Google image searches if you come into the advanced options um, what you can do if you scroll down to the bottom you can uh, select the usage rights you want to filter by for this I use free to use or share um, because I'm not actually going to be uh, using this commercially I'm just using it for demonstrative purposes um, so that would, was enough for me, but if I wanted to use this in a commercial project, I would have to add that tag on. Um, then I did a search for Sunny Street, and uh, I got loads and loads of photos, but in the end I settled on this photo I got from a photographer known as Urban Legend on Flickr. Okay, so in 3D Studio Max, the first thing we're going to be doing is if you press Alt and B, it brings up the background, uh, the viewport background dialog box. And I'm going to click on files and navigate to my camera matching folder where I have stored my image and um, click open. Now, there's a few different options here, so dictating what aspect ratio it matches, but I'm actually going to leave this to, view to a match viewport. Um, and uh, that's uh, everything is going to basically stay as is. Now the problem with match viewport, whilst it is useful because it rescales everything nicely, um, is you can get this uh, sort of very stretched image here. Um, and uh, that's not what we want. What we want is to have the aspect ratio always stay the same as our rendered aspect ratio. So if I press Shift F, it puts this safe frame around the window, which means it's going to stay, even when I resize to full size, the correct aspect ratio. If I were to go into my uh, render dialog box, oops, sorry, that's my material editor, there we go. Um, I can uh, change this figure here, and you can see that it, it's changing my uh, my uh, aspect ratio there. But we can keep this at the default of 640 by 480 because that's pretty much the aspect ratio I want. Okay, so the first thing you need to do, and possibly the most important thing, is to match the angle of this uh, ground plane with the ground plane in your scene. I'm going to be using the uh, camera navigation controls for this. Um, again, this is assuming that you've not got great knowledge of Max yet, so I'm going to be using Alt and the middle mouse button to uh, almost rotate this uh, the floor plane, and then just the middle mouse button on its own to move it. So just with the combination of those two keys, it's quite easy just to line that up. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking to match this outer edge of my grid with the, the, the straight line of this curb. So when I've got that matched up it looks like it's pretty much uh, sat on that floor plane there which is good. So again that was uh, Alt and middle mouse to rotate and then just the middle mouse on its own to move it. Now what you're actually doing here is mo moving a camera um, so once you've got it matched up, you want to make sure that that camera's not going to move. And to uh, do that, we press Control c Now watch up here, Control c So that changed from perspective to camera 001. What Control c has done is it's created a camera uh, from the current view. So I was in perspective mode, and I changed it. I created a camera in that location. So now if I go back into perspective move mode, I can move my camera and you can see that I've created that camera in its place so, and that's what I'll be rendering from. Okay, let's drag out some geometry now. I'm going to drag out a floor plane so I'm going to in the in the create tab I'm going to click on plane and just drag a plane out. That'll do. Now you can press W to select the move tool and just move that into place if you want um, and you can use R which is the scale tool to uh, just alter the uh, basic dimensions of it. I'm also going to bring in the uh, the uh, object that I want to see sat on the floor. I'm going to go into my extended primitives. I'm going to choose a torus knot. Now for the torus knot you're going to drag out twice. You drag out left click and drag once to create the knot itself and then you drag again to set how thick you want the knot to be. There. 
Okay, so pressing W, I can move that into place, and I'm going to think that that might be a little bit too big. So in pressing R to get my scale button, uh, scale tool even, I'm going to put my mouse over this middle section, which moves in all the dimensions, and scales it down. And about that big will do. Move it down onto my ground plane. That's W to get to the move tool, and E to rotate it. I want it round about there. Okay, let's do a render and see what we've got. So what you can see, we've got the geometry, but we've not got that background image. And for this, per for the purpose of this tutorial, uh, we want that background image in there. Um, so let's have a look how we get that in. You do that in the rendering tab. If you go to rendering and then environment, the keyboard shortcut is 8. Um, it brings up the environment and effects dialog box. Press uh, the environment map. And then again, select a bitmap and navigate to where your file is. And select OK. So with that in, if I were to re-render quickly, you can see that we've got this background image in now, but the, uh, the floor plane is not matching to it. To do that, we're going to open the material editor. I've got the material editor set to a compact mode instead of the slate material editor, so you can do that if you want to match up. I'm going to go into uh, uh, this texture here, the second one along. I'm going to click on the button that says Arc and Design for me at the moment. It might say Standard for you. And I'm going to type in at the top, Matte. And I'm going to select this Matte Shadow Reflection toolbox. Now, if it doesn't say that for you, if it just says Matte Shadow, you need to go into your render dialog setup and uh, and select right down at the bottom of the common tab. You want to select the uh, the renderer to be mental ray, which is if I show you assign renderer, and you'll select this little button to select mental ray, and then that that text will be available. So this will um, this is a, a special compositing uh, material. Um, which means that it only receives shadows and reflections um, and acts as a matte object, which is an object which obscures objects behind it. So if I were to render that now, it's pure black. The reason for that is you need to set a texture for it to work by. Now, we already have the texture loaded into 3D Studio Max, which is this texture here, and we want to drop it into this camera matte background. So if I left-click, drag, and drop, as a copy, that is important, it needs to be a copy, we've got that done. So if I were to re-render, you can see that the floor plane seems to have vanished and the torus is still there. That's a good start. Now let's see about getting some shadows in there. The, to get the shadows in, I'm going to go into my uh, light settings. So in my create tool, in my, into my light tab, I'm going to change this to standard light and drop in a skylight. It's just a single click and press Q straight away so you don't accidentally put any more in. If I re-render, you can see that what it's done is introduce shadows into my scene. These very faint shadows at the, uh, the base of the object um, are a good place to start when you're setting up an external scene. Next we want to introduce a directional light um, to introduce the harder shadows in the shot. So I'm going to press Alt W to come back into my four screen mode and I'm going to select a mental ray area spot. Zooming out of my top view, I'm going to click where I want the light to start and drag to where I want the light to point. Now this is a target light, so if I press W, I can move it and it still stays pointing where I finished up. So I want it about there, and I want to raise it up to approximately where the sun was coming from. Might just move it across a bit more. There we go. If you click the second tab along, the modifier tab over here, we can change some of the settings for the light. Um, the first thing we're going to change is in the spotlight parameters. I'm just going to push this uh, hotspot beam angle right up to uh, 179.5. If I then re-render, you can see that we've introduced these hard shadows into the scene now. So these are uh, matching the shadows here from this motorbike and coming from this building um, to match the scene up to what we had in the, uh, in the source footage. So that's a good start, but if you note that the shadow is very, very harsh, as in it's got a very defined edge, and it's very, very black. If you look at this shadow here, it's not quite as opaque, because you can see the ground behind it, and it's quite blue. So let's have a look at how to modify that. Open the Materials Editor, 
and you go into the material of the matte shadow reflect and this is where you control what the shadow looks like in terms of opacity and colour. Now to change the opacity first you're going to use this ambient shadow intensity and we're going to turn that up. So push it up to about 0.5 and that makes the shadow less opaque. So you can see there that it's uh, not quite as dark, but it is still a black shadow um, as opposed to this blue one here. So let's change that. I am just going to make it a little bit more. There we go. I'm going to change this from pure white. I'm going to make it more blue. Sort of a bluey green I'm going for here. Let's make it a little bit whiter and see what that looks like. Okay, that's a closer match now between the two shadows. Um, because I've changed the colour, it has become a bit more opaque, so I've introduced a darker colour. So just pump this back up, maybe to 0.55, and re-render. Excellent. That's a, that's a pretty close match now. I might just uh, alter the position of the light to get a, a slightly more angled shadow, because it might not in be entirely realistic to the scene, but... I think your eye will accept it better if you've got a bit more angle on that light. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to soften that shadow up. Now, this parameter is affected by the uh, the uh, attributes in the uh, in the light itself. We're going to affect the area light parameters, and we're going to change the type to disk, and just increase that to about 15 centimeters. What that does, it makes the light broader, so the shadow is more diffuse and more spread out. Um, and you can see there that it has just softened that edge up nicely for us, making it a lot more believable, more realistic. You see that this shadow does not have a pure hard edge, it does have slight softness to it. Okay, so that pretty much covers the basics of how to set it up, and we're pretty much there. Um, let me just see how much time we've got left on this video. Uh, I think we've got enough time. What we're going to do is we're going to bring in a HDRI light um, which will uh, add a bit more detail and some reflection to the scene. So what we're going to do is go into this material here which is an Arkham Design material and set its template to a uh, glossy varnished wood and I'm going to drop that onto the image there. And what I'm going to do is I'll do a quick render. You can see that it kind of, it will kind of look see-through. Look, you can see the building behind it. That's because this is a reflective material and it's trying to reflect this environment. And the environment is a 2D image that won't wrap around, so it ends up looking transparent. To correct that, in your material editor, you want to introduce a material to the uh, environment tab here in the special purposes maps. Now I'm going to introduce a bitmap um, and I'm going to introduce it with this HDRI final image. Um, there is a tutorial I've made specifically on how to work with these files within 3D Studio Max. So uh, you, I recommend having a look at that and seeing what, what the tricks are with that. But if we have a quick look. Excellent. You can see that now we've got a bit of reflection in there as well. This hot spot from the light. If you want to uh, move how that image is, uh, that um, texture is set out. Um, in, the, in the texture tab you can start playing with the offset of the uh, of that texture and do another quick render to see how that's moved the light spots for us which will do nicely you can also if you want to add a bit more depth to your lighting um, if you select the uh, uh, skylight you can let me just see go up I'm going to drag and drop this as a instance so now the light emitted by that is coloured according to that uh, HDRI light probe. It just adds an, another final little layer of detail. So that covers everything now. That's uh, everything from finding your image, setting it up in 3D Studio Max, bringing in a floor plane, bringing in geometry, and then setting it all up for render, including lighting. Um, I hope that's been useful for you, and I hope some of these skills are also transferable to other projects that you might be working on. Uh, my recommendation is try this out with lots of images and lots of different materials and see what sort of results you get. Uh, thank you very much for your time on this, and uh, my name's Alex P. Twig.